Hello and welcome to the True Crime and Mystery Lounge. Today we have a rare treat. We're going to take a trip to Egypt, specifically Alexandria. Alexandria is a beautiful city on the Mediterranean coast, founded by Alexander the Great back in 331 BC. It's a slice of paradise that history buffs would love to explore, from the ruins of the lighthouse to the Library of Alexandria, beautiful mosques and churches, lots of restaurants and shops. There's always something to do. But what if I told you there was a dark side to this ancient city. Yes, we are going to explore the lives of Egypt's first female serial killers, Rhea and Skina. They were the ringleaders of a small gang and they were quite clever in how they managed to pull off the schemes they did and for so long. Let's go ahead and take a look, shall we? Rhea and Skina Ali Hamem were born in a remote village in Upper Egypt. Rhea was born in 1875 and Skina was born 10 years later in 1885. They lived with their mother and brother and their father abandoned them at a young age. They lived in poverty and struggled to get by. Their mother often sent the sisters out to sell roasted vegetables to try and make money. Their mother was an eccentric lady. She didn't show much affection towards her children. They moved around quite often until they settled in Kafr el Zayat, which is located on the delta of the Nile River. They stayed there until they both got married, but married life was rough. Gina and her husband divorced. She left the village and moved to the large city of Tenta. She worked as a prostitute at a brothel until she met Mohammed Abdelal. They soon got married and moved to Alexandria. Meanwhile, Rhea was still living in the village and got married to Hasbala, who was the brother of her dead husband. He was a thief and a smuggler and was often in trouble with the authorities. Because of all the trouble he was causing, Hezbollah and Rhea were banished from there. So they went to live with her sister and her husband in Alexandria. Times were tough during World War I. Alexandria was a major port city, but it was becoming harder to export cotton. And so because of this, major cotton manufacturers started laying off its workers. Both Rhea and Skina's husband worked in the cotton industry, so they were soon out of a job. So they had to figure out a way to make money. The sisters came up with an idea of opening up a brothel where people could come and indulge in drugs, drinking, and sex. First one was open near a British army base known as the camp. Soldiers businessmen, married men and women often frequented the camp, mainly to get away from their spouses, and business was looking good. So as more soldiers came in, they opened up four more brothels in different parts of the city. Of course, prostitution is illegal in Egypt, and if anyone asked the sisters about it, they would deny having anything to do with any immoral behavior. And to keep the neighbors quiet who disapproved of what they were doing, they hired protection. Arabi and Abdul Razik. But as the war ended, their business started to slow to a crawl and even though they were under British occupation, Egypt was pushing for independence. There was an uprising in March of 1919 against the British which resulted in strikes and curfews. The economy started to suffer as did the sisters business that they had spent five years building. It got so bad that they had to resort to stealing food just to get by, which Hezbollah and Rhea were caught and spent six months in prison. They didn't want to give up their comfortable lives so they had to come up with a new plan. At the time, Alexandria's elite did not deposit their money in banks. Instead, they invested in gold jewelry and wore it on their neck, wrists, ankles, and hands. The plan was to find the most decorated woman in the market, have one of the sisters strike up a conversation. If the woman was receptive, then she would lure them into their house, offer them a drink which was laced with drugs to knock them out, and steal the jewelry, which they would in turn sell the jewelry to a local jeweler for cash. But of course, you can't just rob them and leave them to tell the the police what happened so they would have to kill them and dispose of their bodies somewhere. Each member of the gang would have a role to play. Rhea or Skina would approach the women, offer them wares for cheap or promise of alcohol. Some of these women actually knew them so they never suspected anything. Once they were at one of the homes and they were drunk or knocked out from the drugs, the men would attack the woman, pinning her down and stuffing a wet cloth in her mouth and nose until she stopped breathing. Then they would strip her of everything, clothes, jewelry, and anything else she happened to have on her 
Afterwards, the men would remove the tiles from the floor, dig a hole, bury the corpse in it, and reset the tile. They sold the jewelry to a local jeweler, Ali Hassan, and divided the money amongst the six of them. The gang's first victim, Hanim, Rhea's neighbor, who had bought some new jewelry, which provoked Rhea's jealousy. Following the murder, Rhea went to fetch her sister, who was elsewhere at the time. Once Skeena arrived to Rhea's home, Skeena found her husband, brother-in-law, and the other two gang members digging a grave. She then turned to Hanim's body, lying open-eyed beneath a bench, and was about to scream when Rhea threatened to do the same to her if she uttered a word. Skeena was handed her share of the loot, which amounted to three Egyptian pounds. This pattern seemed to pay off until the missing persons report started coming into the police. The first missing persons report that came in to the police was filed by a mother of 25-year-old Nazla Abu Alel, who was wearing gold wristlets, a silver anklet, gold earrings, and two gold rings when she went missing. After this, a man reported his sister, Zanuba, went to the market, met Rhea, and never returned. A young 15-year-old girl reported her mother a poultry woman went missing. This report was followed by that of a man whose 50-year-old wife, Fatma Abd Rabu, went missing. She had 54 pounds on her, 18 gold wristlets, a couple of gold bracelets, and a pair of earrings. The next victim was a kerosene seller who was living alone in El Laban. The missing persons reports kept pouring in. This time a Sudanese woman reported her daughter missing in mysterious circumstances. She was wearing 60 pounds worth of jewelry, gold bracelets costing 35 pounds, earrings, and a gold necklace. Police were successful in finding out where she had gone to before she went missing. Gina's name was mentioned and she was brought in for interrogation. However, she denied all allegations and threw police off her tracks. On the morning of December 11, 1920, a passerby discovered human remains on the side of the road. The body was damaged beyond recognition except for the long hair and was completely dismembered. There was also a piece of black cloth and a striped black and white pair of socks near the body. However, these items did not help with identification of the remains. It was only when the owner of a house, which was previously rented by Skeena, reported to police that he had discovered the remains of a woman while digging the floor to repair a drain. Police started growing suspicious. They paid a visit to where Rhea was living. They noticed a powerful smell of incense burning. They asked about the incense. Rhea said it was to cover the smell of her customers who drank alcohol and smoked. After taking a look around, the police noticed some of the floor tiles had been replaced. After going back back to the police department to speak with his supervisor, a team of police went back to Rhea's apartment to remove the tiles. Soon they were hit with an overpowering smell of decomposing bodies. They found three women. Police arrested Rhea and Skeena, their husbands, and the two other men involved. They then went to each of the homes that they stayed in and found more bodies buried in a similar fashion. In all, 17 bodies were recovered, but only 10 were identified. The seven that were not identified were probably runaways or prostitutes, at least according to the police. Both sisters tried to blame each other during their interrogations, but it was Rhea's nine-year-old daughter that was the most credible witness. She saw everything unfold from the crack in the wall, along with many other witnesses that last saw the missing women in the company of Rhea or Skeena before their disappearance. Their fate was sealed. News spread like wildfire in the papers, many expressing their opinion as to whether or not women should receive the death sentence. The trial started on May 10, 1921. The prosecution outlined the crimes to the courts and produced those same witnesses that last saw the missing women in the company of Rhea Orskina before their disappearance. The defense had a very weak case. Six out of nine witnesses decided against testifying. After three days of testimony, the trial ended with the sisters and their husbands being found guilty of murder. Four days later, on May 16th, the chief magistrate sentenced them to death. The two bodyguards also got the death penalty as well. But the jeweler who purchased the jewelry from the sisters got five years in prison. On December 21st, 1921, Rhea and Skeena were hanged. They were the first women to be executed by the modern state of Egypt. The following day, their husbands met the same fate.
Unfortunately, Rhea's daughter was placed in an orphanage. She died a few years later from a mysterious fire. Even though there were many serial killers lurking around during the British control over Egypt, these two sisters stood out because of their heinous crimes, the fact that they were ringleaders of a small gang, and that they were women. There are movies and plays written about them. I can only imagine the terror of living in that time. In the El Laban district, after hearing about the first disappearance, I would have hid every single piece of jewelry I own. But that is the story of Rhea and Skina and their reign of terror that happened over 100 years ago. I tell you, the more I read about this case, the more fascinated I became. I mean, I lived in Alexandria for two years, and I didn't even know about this case until after I came back to the States. It just goes to show that murder is universal. No country is 100% crime-free. But I don't think of Egypt any less because of this. I mean, we are all human. I still love the history, the food, and all the great memories I have from being there. And with that being said, so what did you think of this case? Which case would you like for me to cover next? Let let me know in the comments down below and if you enjoyed this video please like comment and subscribe and tickle that little bell icon so that you don't miss the next episode you never know who i will cover next thanks for hanging out with me in the true crime and mystery lounge this is phoenix signing out have a good evening and stay safe